In Mr. Webster's dictionary, a knot is described as any tie or fastening formed with flexible cord, rope, or the like, including bends, hitches, and splices. Now, to the boatman, knots are important tools in the safe operation of his vessel. A good knot is one which can be tied with both speed and ease and will hold fast after it is tied. It can be untied or cast off with equal speed and ease. Speed, of course, comes only as a result of practice. When learning, it's best to go slowly, one step at a time. To begin with, you should learn three terms commonly used in explaining how to tie knots. First is the bite. A bite forms the basis for tying most knots. The second is the standing part. This is the long or unused portion. The short or free end, the part on the other side of the bite, is called the bitter end. So we have the bite, the standing part, or long portion, and the bitter end, or short end. One of the simplest knots to tie is the overhand knot. Simply form a bite. Then pull the bitter end through the bite and tighten. The overhand forms the basis of many other knots and can be used as an end or stopper knot to keep the end of a line from running out through a hole or a block. A better stopper knot, since it is larger and easier to untie, is the figure eight knot. To tie this knot, make an underhand bite. Bring the bitter end around and over the standing part. Pass the end under, then up through the bite. Let's try it again. Make an underhand bite. Bring the bitter end around and over the standing part. Pass the bitter end under then up through the bite. A reef knot or square knot is one of the easiest knots to use when joining two lines together that are of the same size. Let's take a careful look to see just how it is tied. To make it easier to follow, lines of different colors are used. First, cross the lines over and form an overhand knot, left over right. Then bend the bitter end of one line back until it lies alongside its own standing part. Now bend the other bitter end, right over left, and pass it through the bite formed in the first line. Tighten, and the square or reef knot is formed. Let's watch it again. First, a simple overhand knot, left over right, then fold the bitter end back, making sure it lies alongside its own standing part. Now bend the other bitter end right over left and pass it through the bite in the first line. The secret here is to remember left over right and right over left. But be sure now that you haven't tied a granny or false reef knot. In a granny knot, the bitter ends are separated by the bite. This knot is very apt to slip or jam. However, a granny knot can be easily changed to a square knot by simply reversing the top overhand knot so that each bitter end lies alongside its own standing part. Another useful knot for joining two lines, especially if they are of unequal size, is the sheet bend, sometimes called the Beckett bend. Since it is stronger and more secure, 
it is preferable to join two lines with a sheet bend rather than a square knot. To tie the knot, form a bite in one line so that the bitter end is on the right side. Bring the other line up through the bite, then around to the right under both sides, then up and under itself. A variation of the sheet bend, called the double sheet bend, should be used to join two lines when one is much larger than the other. This knot is less apt to slip and easier to untie than the sheet bend. To tie this knot, form the bite in the larger line so that the short end is on the right side. Bring the other line up through the bite, then around to the right, under both sides. Then bring the end up and under itself. At this point, to form a double sheet bend, run the end once more around both sides of the bite and again under itself. Let's try it again. Form a bite in the larger line so the short end is on the right side. Bring the other line up through the bite and then around to the right, under both sides, up and under itself. Then around and under itself once more. As you finish tying the knot, both of the short ends should be on the right side. If the ends are on opposite sides, the knot has a tendency to slip. This is the Carrick Bend. It is a very good knot for tying two lines together when there will be great strain on the knot, such as when joining two parts of a tow line. In addition to being very strong, the Carrick Bend will not jam and become difficult to untie. Here is how the knot is tied. With one end of the line, form an overhand bite with both the bitter end and the standing part pointing away from you. Lay the second bitter end across the bite and alongside the standing part. Now pass the second end under the standing part over the first bitter end under the right side of the bite over itself and under the left side of the bite. Let's try it again. With one end of the line, form an overhand bite with both the bitter end and the standing part pointing away from you. Lay the second bitter end across the bite and alongside the standing part. Now pass the second end under the standing part over the first bitter end under the right side of the bite, over itself, and under the left side of the bite. The knot as now tied presents a figure eight appearance. When strained, the knot properly upsets into two bites and there is a small amount of initial slippage. On this knot, as on all others, Additional security can be gained by seizing the ends of the standing parts. This next knot is called a round turn and two half hitches. It is used to fasten a line to a ring or a post. To tie this hitch, pass the line through the ring once and then around and through a second time. Then cross the bitter end over the standing part to make a bite. Then around the standing part and through the bite to form the first half hitch. The second half hitch is made the same way. Pass the end around the standing part and through the bite to complete the knot. This knot is very reliable and is often used when mooring. Let's tie it again. 
pass the line through the ring once, then around and through a second time. Form the two half hitches around the standing part and the knot is finished. A clove hitch is used for securing a line to a post or a pile. This hitch is easily made and loosened. When tied on a large pile, it will hold up to 90% of the strength of the line. Watch how this is done. Form a bite with the bitter end under the standing part. Loop it over the top of the pile. In the free end, form a second bite. Again with the bitter end under, drop this bite over the top of the pile and tighten. Let's try it again. Form a bite with the bitter end under. Loop it over the pile. Again, form a bite with the bitter end under and loop it over the pile. If you can remember the word under, you can't go wrong. Keep the bitter end under the standing part. One of the best hitches is the rolling hitch, also called the midshipman's hitch. This hitch can be tied in a tight line, will not slip, and can be easily cast off regardless of how much tension there is on the line. Pass the line through the ring, and for this knot allow plenty of length for the bitter end. Cross this end over the standing part some distance from the ring. Bring the bitter end up through the bite to form a half hitch. Draw the half hitch as tight as possible. Still holding tension on the half hitch, pass the end through the bite again, making a complete turn around the first half hitch. Tightening the bitter end kinks the standing part, ensuring that the first half hitch will hold. Another half hitch or lock hitch on the standing part completes the rolling hitch. Let's try it again. Pass the line through the ring and make the first half hitch. Notice how the second turn goes above the first and how pulling it tight makes the line take a kink. This is the whole secret of making this knot hold. Now the second or lock hitch is made. The rolling hitch is cast off by simply passing the end through the bite first formed and then pulling it to break the hitch open. The rolling hitch requires considerable practice, but when you get the knack of it, you'll find it has plenty of uses. For example, two lines passing through the same ring at different angles can be tightened by placing a half hitch around both lines on the V and then pulling them together. A half hitch might slip but can be secured by forming a rolling hitch. The anchor bend, or fisherman's bend, is similar to the rolling hitch and is used for making a line fast to an anchor, buoy, or spar. To tie this knot, take two turns through the ring, followed by an underhand bite. Then thread the bitter end through the turns and pull tight. You should give the bitter end an extra hitch around the standing part for greater strength. The anchor bend is different from the rolling hitch in that the two loops will swivel freely around the ring or post. Now let's repeat. Take two turns through the ring, followed by an underhand loop. Then thread the bitter end through the turns and pull tight. Add an extra hitch around the standing part for greater strength. Every boatman should know how to secure a line to a cleat. 
Let's see just how this is done. The line is first pulled to the cleat, looped around one lug, then brought up, over, and around the other lug. Then looped over the first lug again. It is made secure by forming a bite with a bitter end under, then looping it over the second lug, then make a second bite with a bitter end under the standing part, and loop it over the first lug of the cleat. Let's try that again. The line is first pulled to the cleat, looped around one lug, then brought up, over, and around the other lug, then looped over the first lug again. It is made secure by forming a bite with the bitter end under, then looping it over the second lug. Then make a second bite with the bitter end under the standing part, and loop it over the first lug of the cleat. This is a bowlin. It is frequently used to tie a temporary eye in the end of a line. Its shape is similar to a sheet bend, but since it is tied in the end of one line rather than used to join two lines, a different method is needed to tie it. To tie the bowlin, make an overhand bite with a standing part held toward you. Pass the end up through the bite, then up behind the standing part, then down through the bite again. Let's take another look at this knot. Make an overhand bite with the standing part held toward you. Pass the bitter end up through the bite, then up behind the standing part, then down through the bite again. The knot is easy to untie even after becoming very tight by bending the knot. Let's try the bowline again, this time on a ring. Pass the bitter end through the ring. Make an overhand bite with the standing part held toward you. Pass the bitter end up through the bite, then up behind the standing part, and down through the bite again. Let's try that once more. Pass the bitter end through the ring. Make an overhand bite with the standing part held toward you. Pass the bitter end up through the bite, then up behind the standing part, and down through the bite again. To tie a bowline on a bite, take a length of double line. Cross it back over the standing part, and loop a bite from the standing part over it. Fold the short end far enough through the bite, to get enough slack so it can be passed around the lower portion of the knot. Now pull it tight, making sure that the original bite stays in the standing part of the line, and the bullet on the bite is completed. Now let's do that again. Take a length of double line, cross it back over the standing part, and loop a bite from the standing part over it. Pull the short end far enough through the bite to get enough slack so that it can be passed around the lower portion of the knot. Now pull it tight, making sure that the original bite stays in the standing part of the line and the bowlin on the bite is completed. This knot forms a double eye in the middle of a line, which has a variety of uses. When a piece of natural fiber line, like manila, is cut from a spool, 
a temporary whipping should be made to keep the strands from unraveling. Here is the easiest and one of the best ways to accomplish this. Using a light piece of marlin, lay a loop along the line and then make a series of turns around the line and over the loop. When the width of the wraps is equal to the diameter of the line, pass the working end through the loop and pull it back into the middle of the whipping. Let's try that again. Using a light piece of marlin, lay a loop along the line, then make a series of turns around the line and over the loop. When the width of the wraps is equal to the diameter of the line, pass the working end through the loop and pull it back into the middle of the whipping. Complete the whipping by trimming both ends short. With lines of synthetic fiber, the ends should be seared with a heated device such as a soldering iron to fuse the fibers together. Care should be taken to avoid a piece of hot fiber falling on your bare skin. Since many lines spend at least as much time in storage as they do in use, it is important that they be prepared and stowed properly. To prepare a line for storage, it should be coiled in uniform loops. The picked up end that you start with must hang below the center of the coil. When almost all of the line has been coiled, the bitter end should be brought from the top of the coil and wrapped snugly several times around the coils. The bitter end is then passed through the top loop and pulled tight. When bunched in this manner, the coil will stay together under most conditions. However, if you wish to hang the line up by the bitter end for storage, here is another method that will keep the coils more securely gathered. After the line is coiled and wrapped, as in the previous method, a loop is made from the loose end and then passed through the upper part of the coil. The loop is then placed over and around the coil and positioned at the top of the wraps. The bitter end is pulled tight and once more passed up through the top of the coils to serve as a carrying line. Although this method takes a little longer to do than the first, the added security is often worth the effort. Speed in tying knots and the ability to tie them under all conditions, even in the dark, comes only from continued practice. Knowing which knot to use is as important as how to tie it. Your ability to select the right knot and to tie it properly is an important part of good seamanship. When used incorrectly, knots become a liability and a danger. However, when correctly used, they are extremely helpful and will increase your boating pleasure. child, I didn't like boats. I was always afraid I'd get seasick. Then one day, it all changed. And I realized I like boats. 
I like everything about them. I like to look at them. I like to read stories about them. I even started to dream about them. Ah, welcome to paradise. And what better way to enjoy it than with a little fishing for albacore? Now let me see. Where is slip 32? Ah. Ah. What a beauty. Got step one, untie the boat. Boating people, great. Never too busy to give you a wave. Time for a little refreshment. Look out, fish. Here I come. Hey, am I drifting in on those rocks? Better throw out the anchor just to be safe. Let's see where... Oh, yeah. I wonder how deep it is here. There she goes. Oh, no. Why wasn't that tied? Getting closer. Empty. Where did I put that extra can of gas? Closer, for sure. I better get a life jacket. No anchor line. No gas. Oh, what is this stuff? Looks like somebody's laundry. Why is this happening to me? I didn't need a gypsy with a crystal ball to tell me the meaning of that dream. There were things about boats that I needed to learn, and that's exactly what I decided to do. With my shoes. Rowboats. 
sailboat, powerboat, single engine, twin engine, inboard, outboard. Jet riding. I got a fly or sail. There are different shaped hulls, different kinds of sails. Some boats have one kind of power. Some have another kind. There's a lot more of this boating thing than I thought. What did they say? The word port has four letters in it, and so does the word left. So if port is on the left, then starboard has to be on the right. Oh, I love these boating words. Starboard. Astern. Fore and aft. Athwart ships. <laughs> A fort ship. During rough weather, a boat can capsize especially in the choppy water around harbor entrances. If you perceive yourself to be in danger, you should consider the possibility... <laughs> If you perceive yourself to be in danger, you should consider the possibility that anchoring may improve your safety. The anchor gives you control until you can solve the problem. Oh. As it turns out, anchoring was the subject of my first boating class. We learned not to heave it over the side like a sack of beans, but to lower it evenly. And we found that there is more to anchoring than meets the eye. This anchor was well buried in the sand. We dug a hole and set it much deeper than it would be set in normal use underwater. Julie, will you try to pull this anchor out of the sand, please? No holding power at all. Now let's try something else. Peter and Tim, pick up the end of the anchor line and run down the beach a ways. I'll tell you when to stop. Okay, stop. Now pull the anchor towards you. Go ahead, pull it hard. <laughs> this anchor is designed with pivoting flukes, so that heavy pulls will cause it to work its way deeper into the ocean floor, but only if the anchor line is kept low. Okay, guys, that's enough. If the water is 10 feet deep, then you'll need a minimum of at least 50 feet of anchor line. If the water is 20 feet deep, you'll need a minimum of 100 feet of anchor line. Now, that's in calm seas. In rough weather, you may need an anchor line up to 10 times longer than the depth directly below your boat. What kind of rope is this, anyway? Nylon. Nylon anchor line has an elasticity that cushions the shock of sudden pulls from your boat. The weight of the chain keeps the anchor line low, and it also prevents the line from breaking due to chafing. There, that's a bowline. Probably the most useful of all knots aboard a boat. It never slips, it never jams, and it can always be untied. With enough practice, you'll be able to tie a bowline in the dark on a rough sea. Could save your life, Tim. I can understand how your life might need saving in that kind of boat, but I found it hard to believe that all these people know how to tie a bowline in the dark. I was about to learn two new boating words, gunnel and freeboard. In this area between the waterline and the gunnel is called the freeboard. When you diminish your freeboard, you're in danger. If you lose it, you swamp. You can have the same number of people in a boat, but depending on where you place them, you can have ample freeboard where you need it. Distribute the weight evenly and never exceed the limits printed on your boat's capacity plate. Now, let's get a couple more people in this boat. Don't worry if you swamp. You probably won't sink all the way to the bottom because all the newer boats under 21 feet long are designed to float even when they're full of water. Our instructor put us in a full boat. 
He asked us to ignore his advice about an even distribution of weight and shift around in the boat. Oh. In no time at all, we lost our freeboard. The boat kept filling with water and, <laughs> boy, was it unstable. Another instructor showed us how easy it was to capsize once you let yourself get into this condition. Don't panic. Stay with the boat. Don't try to swim the shore. Have you checked to see if anyone's missing? Remember, if you're out in the ocean, the water would be cold. Hyperthermia would be a problem. Imagine yourself in deep water. Imagine the fear you would feel. Imagine the physical difficulty. I don't have to imagine the physical difficulty. Oh, no. What is it? My wallet. I forgot. Oh, gee. I forgot to leave my wallet on shore. <laughs> Wetter, but wiser, we headed for shore to dry out and get ready for our next class. Docking. A number of instructors were on hand to teach us how to behave around the dock. We learned to use our motor in reverse to pull us away from the dock. Okay, let me see you back away from the dock one more time. All right. We'll repeat of that. Okay? The engine's in the center now, so which way do you turn the wheel? That's it, away from the dock. Okay, now put it in reverse. There you go. Perfect. Good job. We'll leave it there until you, you're well away from the dock so you're clear of other boats. Coming in on the dock is a little different. As you approach the dock at an angle, you turn your wheel away from the dock. Then you put the motor in neutral and turn the wheel toward the dock as you put it in reverse. The procedure is simple to describe, but a little trickier in practice. Always think when you're coming into the dock, I'm coming towards the dock, I'm turning the wheel towards the dock. Okay, it's a little helpful hint. It all feels strange at first, but it works. One by one, we began to get the hang of this maneuver. And we discovered that each boat handled a little differently, especially in the slow speeds used in docking. Came in at a real sharp angle and didn't get the stern swinging to the dock. Remember, the inboard engine has less maneuverability than an outboard, so you have to have that stern motion already moving and closer to the dock. Sailboats were the biggest surprise of all. All right, that's good. You're coming in nice and slow. We knew that a sailboat using its auxiliary engine was legally a motorboat, but sailboats aren't really very maneuverable That's under good. power. Peter, Their engines are small, line. so are the propellers, and the extra weight of a sailboat makes docking a slow process. Okay, that's a good angle. Remember, turn the wheel towards the dock before you put it in I reverse. had to admit, I felt ready for that some boy. serious boat. Perfect. Hit. Very right. good. Very good. Right. 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 Yeah. Our instructor urged us to practice on our own time with someone who was an experienced boat operator. I spoke to my friend Paul and he agreed that our friendship would probably survive my practicing in his boat. Paul said that you have to keep a good lookout constantly, or as the textbook says, be vigilant. We went to an uncrowded area and practiced stopping at different speeds so I could understand the distance required to bring the boat to a full stop. Paul said that even the experienced boaters practice before taking out a boat for the first time. Later I practiced turns to get used to the boat's turning radius at different speeds. I also learned that the best way to soften the impact of another boat's wake is to angle your boat into it. In high-speed operation, you follow the same basic procedures, only you pre-plan even further ahead because you have a wider area to worry about.
On our way back, Paul and I stopped to talk to a friend, George Wilson. You need a good anchor and lots of line and chain. And you should have enough Coast Guard approved life jackets to go around. He was getting ready for a day or two of ocean sailing. I like to have non-swimmers and children wear them from the time we leave the dock. Now, if we run into rough conditions, of course, then we all put them on. Incidentally, one advantage is, is that they keep you a lot warmer. Charge? Uh-huh. You really need those even if you're just going out for the day? You never know when you're going to need a charge. For example, if you're in deep water and you develop a problem, or a fog comes up, you might want to anchor. Well, it's nice to be able to take a glance at the chart and know the exact depth under the boat. It makes anchoring easier. Yeah, I see what you mean. You know, most people wait too long before they anchor. Do it right away. Right. Now, if it looks like you're in trouble, that's the time to call for help on your marine radio. And always keep some flares handy. You know, help someone to find you. Make sure they're Coast Guard approved. Yes. Taking all this in, Tim? Yeah. Actually, the first thing I take before I go out on the ocean is some seasick pills. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing, I keep extra clothing stored below. It's a lot cooler out on the ocean, especially at night. You need to have warm, waterproof gear in case you run into rough weather. Is that likely to happen? I mean, it looks so nice out. Oh, it'll be okay. I got a marine weather report a little while ago, and I'll check the local radio weather report later. Now, of course, when you're out there, you have to keep looking at the weather, checking it all the time. You can usually see bad weather coming and head back to port. That's why you always want to have a float plan to let someone know where you're going and when you expect to be back. Be sure to give it to someone who cares if you get back. <laughs> great idea. <laughs> it was great sitting in the harbor talking with Paul and George. Oh, there are differences of opinion. Paul loves his powerboat, and George obviously loves sailing. But they agree that skippering any boat is a big responsibility. George says, under sail or under power, the skipper never, ever drinks anything alcoholic until the boat is safely back at the dock. Our group spent some time boating on inland rivers and lakes. It was quite different from the ocean. Calm, quiet, and because we weren't used to it, a little mysterious. Our instructor had us search for rocks that were hidden just below the waterline and therefore doubly dangerous. This is exactly what I meant about hazards on lakes and rivers. Keep an eye out for shoals and submerged rocks and logs. And floating branches. Now, uh, everyone, take a look to starboard. See that sandbar over there? I bet many a boat's been hung up on that. And don't let anyone tell you that inland waters don't get rough. Storms can come up without any warning at all. The waves on lakes are shorter, choppier, and they can be very dangerous. About the only thing I regretted was my mystifying inability to tie a bowling. I could swear that piece of rope had more than two ends. I started thinking that not knowing how to tie a bowline just might cost me my life. I may kill myself. I did have to admit that I knew a lot more about boating than when I began. And I met a group of really nice people who seemed to enjoy boating as much as I did. If you get nothing else from this class, take with you the idea that safe seamanship is preparation and good habits. Pre-plan your maneuvers. Don't overload. Keep the boat trim and become familiar with boating rules in your area. And try that bowling one more time, Tim. All right, Tim. Yeah! <laughs> My first bowling. Was I ever proud? I figured next I'd tie one in the dark, behind my back, while moored in a beautiful bay in Tahiti. <laughs> <laughs> 